I realize Mark Conway and some of the other people are still getting their food, but we're actually going to start a little bit earlier today so that Noreen has a little bit more time to talk and then there's a little bit of uh, a time for Q&A at the end. So we're going to start. First, let me welcome all of you. I'm Brother David Paulang. Uh, together with Chick Hardy, uh, we are part of the Benedictine Institute, and this is one of our programs. We're happy to see some of you who are here for the first time to one of these Lunch and Learn events. Welcome. These monthly gatherings where we come together for a meal and a thought-provoking short presentation are one of the ways the Benedictine Institute tries to promote that Catholic Benedictine character of this place with its unique history, culture, and spirituality. So be sure to keep an eye out for the last uh, lunch and learn of the fall semester on November 16th, when Father Eric Hollis is gonna give a presentation on building community one person at a time. As for today, you may be wondering how a presentation on the topic of Islam and ISIS fits with the mission of a Catholic Benedictine Institute. And to a casual observer, it might seem incongruous. But Benedictines have never closed themselves off entirely from the world. Understanding the challenges of our times and listening carefully to others so as not to judge strangers unfairly is absolutely necessary for the practice of hospitality. Listening and hospitality go hand in hand, as we all know. So it seemed fitting that we should provide an opportunity to consider the unique challenge facing Islam in our world today, particularly since the challenge affects all of us. I don't know about your experiences, but I know that I can use help in understanding Islam as the St. Cloud area becomes home to more and more Muslims and understanding the difference between the practi practitioners of Islam and the relatively new offshoot that is known as ISIS is critical in this area, in this place, if we're to avoid painting with too broad a brush. So talking about all Muslims as if they are all the same is, of course, as unfair as talking about all Christians as if we are all the same. And so it's critical that we come to know our neighbors better, no matter where we live. Hence today's presentation and topic. Our presenter, Dr. Noreen Hertzfeld, for those of you who might not know her yet, is the Nicholas and Bernice Reuter Professor of Science and Religion at St. John's University in the College of St. Benedict. She holds degrees in computer science and mathematics from the Pennsylvania State University and a PhD in theology from the Graduate Theological Union, Berkeley. Unique among all the faculty for her particular scholarly interests, Noreen teaches courses in both the Department of Computer Science and the Department of Theology at St. John's University and College of St. Benedict, reflecting her two primary research interests, the intersection of religion and technology and religion and conflict. Various topics for her courses include computer theory, computer ethics, religion and science in dialogue, the spirituality and politics of Islam, and religion and conflict. She's also a writer and has authored a number of books. In Our Image, Artificial Intelligence and the Human Spirit, Technology and Religion, Remaining Human in a Co-Created World, and The Limits of Perfection in Technology, Religion, and Science. She's also published numerous articles on a wide variety of fascinating topics, cyberspace as a venue for spiritual experience, embodiment as a sine qua non for personhood, the religious implications of computer games, and the prospects for reconciliation among Christians and Muslims in Bosnia. With that short introduction, please help me give Noreen a warm collegeful welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, is this working? This mic? Can you hear me? All right, I'm glad that all of you took the entire afternoon off from work so that we could <laughs> talk about this question. Um, I am going to try in about uh, 35 or 40 minutes to take you through a whirlwind tour um, 
of Muslim, or the history of Islam, and uh, looking particularly at certain issues. When we think about ISIS, we see these pictures in the news, on Facebook, um, we see people being beheaded, we see uh, women veiled, we see slaves in chains, um, we see jihadis ready for warfare. Um, and this, in many ways, is becoming the face of Islam that a lot of people in the West are seeing when they think about it. So my question today is, is ISIS really Islamic? They say they are. They say that they are resurrecting the caliphate, the ancient idea of a pan-Islamic state, and that they are going back to the time of Muhammad and taking the Middle East back where it should be to the kind of community that was there when Muhammad was alive. Okay, we're gonna take a whirlwind tour uh, to see if we think that's really the case or not. So let's return to the start and begin with, all right, so who was Muhammad? When did he live? And what was the community like when Muhammad was alive? So Muhammad was born in 570. He was born in Mecca in the Arabian Peninsula. He was orphaned by the age of five. This was an important part of his experience. He grew up first with his grandparents and then later with an uncle. Uh, the uncle was part of the Quraysh, which was the most important tribe inside Mecca. They were the, the Meccan 1% at the time. So Muhammad grows up with these two competing influences. On the one hand, he's part of the wealthiest tribe in the neighborhood. On the other hand, he's an orphan. So he's certainly not in positions of power. Um, Mecca, as I said, was dominated by the Quraysh tribe, and they derived a great deal of their revenue from pilgrims who came to the Kaaba. The Kaaba, which is the most sacred site in Islam, it's uh, this black stone building, um, predates Islam. It was actually a pilgrimage site before Muhammad's time, and they had 360 idols there. The Quraysh really did, were polytheists, so anybody who would come through, if they had a new god or goddess, the Quraysh would say, great, you know, bring us a statue, we'll, we'll add them in. I mean, actually, the more the merrier, and the more, the more money, right? So uh, the Quraysh was full of idols, or the Kaaba was full of idols. Muhammad himself became a uh, caravan leader, first just going along with caravans. Later, he started being the leader of the caravans of a wealthy widow named Khadija. And uh, Hadijah, who was um, a good uh, 10 years older than him, at a certain point decided that he was trustworthy, he was handsome, he was still a poor orphan, but she was a wealthy widow, so she asked him to marry her. And uh, Muhammad agreed. Um, he loved her deeply, I believe. He was, she was his only wife even though polygamy was uh, the cultural mode of the day, as long as she lived, she was his only wife. Um, in 610, so when Muhammad is 40, and by the way, this is an interesting thing for all of you women in the room, Muslims say that uh, men do not reach the age of reason until the age of 40. <laughs> <laughs> so some of you may or may or not agree with that. <laughs> They say that Christians have to be wrong that Jesus began his ministry at 30 because no man reaches the age of reason until 40, so he must have been 40 when he began his ministry. Anyway, at 40, Muhammad begins receiving revelations um, through the Archangel Gabriel. Uh, his first revelation, he's, he's gone to a cave outside of Mecca to just have some downtime um, to pray and uh, he just feels this crushing weight. He hears these words that say recite, and he says, I am not a reciter. And the, still, the voice continues to tell him to recite. Um, you have to realize this is an oral culture. There would have been professional poets who were reciters who learned the 
um, legends, the stories of the day. Mohammed was certainly not one of them, which is why he originally says, whoa, whoa, not me, I'm not a reciter. But uh, then these words start just being poured into him. Well, he goes back to Mecca and uh, he takes actually three years before he finally takes these words public. Um, actually, after the first encounter, he runs back home and he throws himself in Khadijah's lap and says, you know, cover me with your cloak, I'm going crazy. And she says, well, you know, what happened, what happened, calm down. You know, and he says, well, you know, I heard an angel and I heard these words. And she says, well, you know, this sort of thing has happened in the past. There are prophets, especially in the Jewish and Christian scriptures. She said, let's go talk to my cousin, Waraka, because he's a Christian and he would know about this sort of thing. So she takes him to talk to her cousin and he says, yeah, there are prophets, this sort of thing does happen. It's interesting that the first people who hear the message of the Quran are a woman and a Christian. Okay? The next person who actually um, claims to be a Muslim, because Muhammad takes his message public, and this message is primarily one of the fact that there is only one God and that that God demands social justice. And the Quraysh say, are you crazy? You know, you're going to ruin our pilgrimage tribe? What do you mean? We've got 360 idols in the Kaaba. You know, if you say there's only one, are there other people going to come? Um, and then they, plus they say, eh, social justice business, you know, um, I don't know. Um, so it's a message they don't want to hear. Uh, the first, the probably third believer, the first person who says, well, you know, I believe this, is a slave. So at least as the story goes, you have a woman, a Christian, and a slave who become the first Muslims. In 619, Khadijah dies, and so does Abu Talib, the uh, influential uncle who had raised Muhammad. And in this way, Muhammad loses his two protectors. And so the Quraysh turn against him and against this small community of early Muslims. And in a sense, they forced them out of town. So you have the, what's called the Hijra, in which the Muslims move from Mecca up to Medina. Now at that time, Medina is just a little collection of um, miscellaneous tribes, some of them Jewish, some of them Arabic, um, who live around an oasis. It's called Yathrib uh, at the time. And they invite Muhammad to come because the tribes are feuding among each other and they need a mediator. So Muhammad comes to be their mediator. And one by one, his followers leave Mecca and go with him up to Medina. The community in Medina um, grows slowly. The people there, he's actually very successful in his mediation efforts. and. Many of them, he preaches these words of one God and social justice. And most of the tribes um, in Yathrib uh, convert. And they elect Muhammad as their sheikh, the leader of what is really now a new tribe. So Muhammad now preaches that your allegiance should not be to your blood tribe. It should be to your religious community to this new tribe that we're forming in what now gets to be called the city of the prophet, um, Medina al-Razul. Um, and he guides the community through these continuing revelations that he has. So let's take a look at some of these revelations. The early revelations that he has while in Mecca tend to just to look at who is God and what does God call us to do. Here is the first surah. This is the first chapter in the Quran, and it is prayed at every Muslim prayer time. In the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful, all praise belongs to God, Lord of the worlds, most compassionate, most merciful, ruler of the day of judgment. It is you we worship and your aid we seek. Show us the straight path, the way of those you have graced, not of those deserving anger, nor those who wander lost. What does this surah say about God? Uh, 
twice. Most compassionate, most merciful. Every single surah in the Quran begins with this first line. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful. These are the words that are found way beyond anything else in the Quran as the most frequent words. Um, he's also the ruler of the Day of Judgment and our guide on the straight path. Other Meccan surahs, which we won't go into because we don't have time, but just briefly what's in them, a lot of biblical stories. You find the story of Adam and Eve. You find the story of Noah and the flood. You find the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Ishmael. Uh, Joseph and his coat and his brothers. You find Moses and the Israelites. You find the Annunciation and the birth of Jesus. Um, many of the stories are not told completely. They're referenced. In other words, it'll say something like, well, you remember about Joseph and his brothers? You know, and then it'll go on from there. So it's obvious that the community was quite familiar with Jewish and Christian scripture. There's also a fair amount of poetry about the name of God. Um, in fact, one of the reasons that the Quran is not translated, um, Muslims believe you really have to read it in Arabic, is because the language is so poetic. They say it's just the sound of the language. You can't capture that in another language. They talk a lot about social justice um, and quite a bit about the Day of Judgment. The Medinan surahs, the later ones, go a lot into practical matters. By this time, Muhammad is the sheikh of this new community. And so they talk about how to divide inheritance. For the first time, women are allowed to inherit in this culture. They talk about food and drink, borrowing heavily from the Jewish laws of what is kosher. They talk about marriage and divorce, and for the first time, women are allowed to divorce their husbands in this culture. And women are allowed to keep their dowry if their husband divorces them. And they talk about simple matters of etiquette. Um, for example, there's a verse that says, if you are asking something from uh, the prophet's wives, it would be better for you to do so from behind a curtain. Okay, now this is actually one verse that has been translated as, oh, that means women are supposed to wear the curtain. Probably not. What it probably meant, because the mosque in Medina was also Muhammad's house, was if you've come to the mosque and then you decide you want to ask for something at the house, you know, stop at the doorway, which is probably curtained, and ask from outside the door. Just don't go barging into somebody else's house. In fact, there is another verse that says, if you come to somebody else's house, call from the doorway. And if they tell you to go away, go away. <laughs> Which makes me think that Mohammed was probably having a little trouble with you know, also living um, in the community center. OK, let's talk a little bit about women's dress, very briefly. Here's the verse from the Quran where you find the most information about how women should be dressed. And say to the believing women that they lower their gaze and restrain their sexual passions, and do not display their ornaments except what appears thereof, and let them draw a veil over their bosoms, and they should not display their ornaments, and let them not strike their feet so that the ornaments that they hide may be known. Huh, what are their ornaments? <laughs> well. Uh, it seems to me that there are two options here. We're living in a Bedouin culture. Option, let's go to option two. Maybe people are dressing rather lightly at home and it's time to pull their veil over their bosoms when they go outside. Option one, you're living in a Bedouin culture. What's the best way to have mobile wealth? Wear it, jewelry. So no ostentatious show of jewelry and don't strike your feet so that it all jangles. OK? Class and etiquette is also something here. Dress is a statement of class and occupation. And in the society at the time, the only women who did veil would have been among the wealthy class, not those who were out working or you know, with the flocks in the field. And then I already mentioned, when you speak to the prophet's wives, do so from behind a curtain. Okay. 
Um, so I just threw this in. My, my classes love this uh, cartoon where the woman in the bikini says, everything covered but her eyes. What a cruel male-dominated culture. And the woman in hijab says, nothing covered but her eyes. What a cruel male-dominated culture. <laughs> How about slaves? Well, um, here are some things from the Quran about slaves. Uh, it tells you to abstain from sex except with those joined to them in the marriage bond or the captive whom their right hand possesses. Oh, good, you get to sleep with your slaves. Um, enjoy what you took in war, lawful and good. You even get to enjoy sleeping with your slaves. And marry those among you who are single and those who are fit among your male slaves and your female slaves. Oh, you really should marry them first. Okay. Um, it is not righteousness that you turn your faces toward east or west, but it is righteousness to spend of your substance for the ransom of slaves. Uh, never should a believer kill a believer. Remember that one when we get to jihad. Uh, but if it so happens by mistake, if one kills a believer, it's ordained that he should free a believing slave and pay compensation to the deceased's family. And verily, we have created man into toil and struggle, and what will explain to you the path that is steep? Freeing a slave. So there, it was a culture, obviously. There's still slavery, just as there is in the Bible. Um, but there's an awful lot about, you know, if you can, marry them, free them, do what you can for that. OK, let's talk about war, jihad. Um, the Quraysh did not like that eventually a lot of their young people were moving up to Medina, joining this new community. And so it doesn't take them too long before they launch an offensive war. Ooh, they just took all the food away. I guess they don't get lunch. Um, before they <laughs> launch an offensive war against the Me Meccans in Medina. Um, Muhammad then says, we're fighting. They have to fight in self-defense, and they fight a series of battles. When one of these major battles was over, the Meccans came back and went, phew, we're done with that. Jihad is over. And Muhammad laughed, and he said, you just prevailed in the lesser jihad. Now you have to fight the greater one. So what do you mean by that? And he said, the greater jihad is the fight against your own sinfulness and pride. So the lesser jihad, yes, you can struggle for justice and you can defend yourself. Um, interestingly enough, when the Meccans are finally defeated by the Muslims, Muhammad does not actually enter Mecca for two years. He goes to the edge of Mecca. He asks the Meccans if the Muslims can enter and visit the Kaaba, the Meccans are afraid, and they kind of arm themselves and say, no, no, please, no, no. And Muhammad turns back to his people who have traveled all the way down from Medina to Mecca and says, we're going home. They're not real happy about that, but they go home. And it's with the idea that later they can come back and do their pilgrimage to Mecca. When they do come back, Mecca, uh, Muhammad gives amnesty to almost all of the Meccan fighters. So that tells you a little bit about Muhammad's own conduct in war. Um, in the Quran, it says several things about when to fight. To those against whom war is made, permission is given to fight because they are wronged, and verily, Allah is most powerful for their aid. And those who have been expelled from their houses for no cause except that they say, our Lord is Allah. So you can fight in defense. You can fight if you've been expelled from your homes. Then it says, if they make war against you, permission is given to fight. Defensive. OK? Now we come to the tough one. So when the sacred months have passed, slay the idolaters wherever you find them. And take them captive and besiege them and lie and wait for them in every ambush. But if they repent and keep up prayer and pay the poor rate, leave their way free. Surely Allah is forgiving, merciful. This is the verse, of course, that Isis will quote. And uh, probably in the context, this verse seems to have come down in the middle of the Meccan Wars when some of the Arabs were saying, whoa, wait a minute, these are our kinspeople. And Muhammad was saying, yeah, well, hey, come on, you got to keep fighting. Um, 
It also says, if any of the idolaters seek thy protection, protect him till he hears the word of Allah, then convey him to a place of safety. This is because they are people who know not. It also says there is no compulsion in religion, so war should never be to spread the faith. How to fight? Fight in the cause of Allah, those who fight you, but do not transgress limits, for Allah loves not transgressions. And Muhammad's successor, the Caliph Abu Bakr, the very first Caliph, okay, Caliph, like Caliphate, gives the following instructions. Do not betray, be treacherous, or vindictive. Do not mutilate. Do not kill children, the aged, or women. Do not cut or burn palm trees or fruit trees. Do not slay a sheep, a cow, a camel, except for your food. And you will come across people who stay in hermitages for worship. Leave them alone to what they devote themselves to. So there are restrictions on how to conduct yourself in warfare. And finally, it says, if anyone slew a person, unless it be for murder or spreading mischief in the land, it would be as if he slew the whole people. And if anyone saved a life, it would be as if he saved the life of the whole people. OK, let's talk then briefly about Sharia. What about Sharia law? You know, we fear Sharia law. In Oklahoma, they're trying to ban Sharia law. What is Sharia law? Well, in 632, Muhammad dies. And like most single rulers, he does not leave a successor. He does not have a son. He only has a daughter. He leaves the Quran behind, uh, but it is not written down. It's just these sayings that people have heard him say. He also leaves a collection of sayings that were not really sayings he said he got from God, just things he said he thought were good to do or not do. Those are called the Hadith. Um, so I'm not going to talk about the problem with the fact that he didn't leave a successor. It ultimately leads to the Sunni Shiite split. It's a disagreement over who should be his successor. Um, there are four caliphs uh, fol that follow Muhammad, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali. Um, the Shiites basically wanted Ali to be caliph all along. He is Muhammad's son-in-law and married to Muhammad's daughter. And they believe it should pass down through the family line. The Sunnis say, we're just going to go back to our tribal methods of how to choose a sheikh. Uh, you choose, you get the council of elders together, and you choose your wisest elder. And that's how Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman get chosen. Ali finally gets chosen fourth. But then who should succeed Ali? The Sunnis and the Shiites disagree, and that's where they split. Um, we see, though, that now we've got to codify this faith. We don't have Muhammad around to run to and ask what to do. Uh, so the Quran gets written down, the Hadith get written down, and we start to see the development of schools of jurisprudence or law. Very quickly, there are four schools of law, and they're in chronological order here. And I just want to highlight something about each of them. The first one says, if you want to know what to do, go to the Quran first. Then use your reason. And then you could use some of these sayings of, of Muhammad. But Quran and reason first. The next school says, well, how about just the consensus of the community? You know, let's just ask the community in Medina and see what their consensus is. They're not particularly interested in analogical reasoning. They're going back to a more tribal way of thinking about things. The third school says, no, we're going to the, the Hadith, the unofficial, the sayings of Muhammad, not the sayings of God that are in the Quran. And we'll sometimes elevate those even above the Quran. We're going to try to follow the example of Muhammad. That is paramount. Uh, and the fourth school takes this even higher, elevates the Hadith above Muhammad, but also returns to the traditions of the Qureshi tribe. Han Ahmed bin Hanbali was a Quraysh. And he says, hey, Muhammad's not here anymore. Let's just pretend that didn't happen and go back to the way things used to be, the old tribal ways. Um, if you look at a map, the only area that follows that fourth school that elevates the sayings above the Quran 
and that elevates the old tribal ways of the Quraysh is the old tribal area of the Quraysh, the central part of the Saudi Arabian Peninsula. And this school of law probably would not have become very important in Islam, except for an accident of history. A firebrand of a preacher and a sort of fundamentalist named Muhammad Abdul Wahab um, starts causing chaos in Central Arabia. He gets kicked out of several towns. Um, he has just this idea that we have to return to an absolutely pure way, and he thinks he knows what that was. Um, but he gets taken in by um, the House of Saud, by the, Saud, the tribe of Saud, uh, in a small town in Central Arabia, based in Riyadh, what is now Riyadh. It wasn't called Riyadh then. Um, there were benefits here to both sides. The uh, leader of the tribe, uh, Ibn al-Saud, um, is looking for a way to kind of make war on neighboring groups. And neighboring groups are Shiite or Sufi. And this firebrand of a preacher says, Shiites and Sufis are heretics. We can kill them. They're not real Muslims. And that gives even so a context in which to say, great, OK, good, let's go kill them. Um, he also then gives protection to Wahhab. And this al tight alliance is born between the tribe of the Al-Sauds and this uh, Wahhabist understanding of Islam. Again, this would not have gone very far. These are a small tribe in the center of the desert. Um, they're kind of nasty. They actually go down and they sack Mecca. They destroy, they go to Medina and they destroy the prophet's tomb, the tomb of Muhammad, because they say people are making pilgrimages there. That's wrong. You know, they're elevating Muhammad too high. They hate Sufis because they dance and they have poetry that talks about drinking wine. God forbid, you know. And they hate the Shiites because they uh, go on pilgrimages to the tombs of their imams. And they, have, they raise the status of their imams fairly high. Um, they are not particularly successful. They get pushed back to their small desert town. But then comes World War I, the breakup of the Ottoman Empire. And have any of you seen the movie Lawrence of Arabia? Well, we have Lawrence to thank for ISIS, basically, because Lawrence allied himself with the Al Saud tribe, and he his tactics made them victorious, you know, and eventually conquerors of the entire Arabian Peninsula. Um, then you get oil. And suddenly, again, what would have been just a small group in the middle of Arabia becomes rich and powerful and is able to build schools, madrasas, mosques all around the world. So imagine if the Ku Klux Klan or Aryan nation obtained total control of Texas and had at its disposal all the oil revenues and used this money to establish a network of well-endowed schools and colleges all over Christendom peddling their particular brand of Christianity. This is what the Saudis have done with Wahhabism. This is what they are still doing because they are, to a large extent, bankrolling ISIS. OK, so is this religious or is this cultural? Um, you've seen the verses in the Quran about women, about slaves, about jihad. You've seen the progression of um, the schools of law getting further and further away from the Quran, more back to the way things always were in the tribal uh, way of thinking. Um, there's a very interesting book called Who Speaks for Islam? What a Billion Muslims Really Think. It's done by the Gallup Foundation. It was a Gallup poll that did six years of research, and they uh, researched, interviewed more than 90% of the world's Muslim communities, um, at least people from those communities. 50,000 interviews in 35 nations. 
The data reveal that Muslims are slightly more likely than Americans to reject attacks on civilians as morally unjustifiable. Large majorities of Muslims would guarantee free speech if it were up to them. What they least admire about the West is the perceived breakdown of traditional values, the same answers most Americans give. And when asked about their dreams for the future, they say they want jobs and security, not conflict and violence. Now, Svetlana Boim, who died just recently, wrote a book on nostalgia. And she said, there are two types of nostalgia. There's good nostalgia and there's bad nostalgia. Good nostalgia is something we all experience on the individual level. It might be the nostalgia you feel for your hometown, the nostalgia you feel for your childhood, for when you were growing up, the nostalgia you might feel for your country if you're living in a different country. Um, then she says there's national nostalgia. This tends to idealize a golden age, usually for the purposes of power. This is the kind of nostalgia, I'm looking now at Christy, at uh, Kelly, at David Paul, we saw this in Bosnia. Um, the kind of nostalgia for um, the Serbs wanted for a past when this, there was a greater Serbia and the Serbs were in control. She says this type of nostalgia is extremely dangerous. And I certainly agree with her, it is. This is, I think, the type of nostalgia that ISIS is engaging in. They um, are saying we're going to reestablish a caliphate, we're going to take the Middle East back to the way it was in Mohammed's time. But my question to you after seeing the brief uh, presentation that I've made is, are they? Are they taking it back to the way it was in Mohammed's time, or are they taking it back to a made-up way that is more cultural and less religious, but that gives them excuses to fight and excuses to take on power? Now, there are still issues, like there is slavery still allowed in the Quran. There is polygamy allowed in the Quran. But I think this is a larger issue for all people of a book, which is what do you do when the book no longer matches the culture? Can you pick and choose verses the way ISIS does? They say, well, but we've got that verse that says, slay the idolaters wherever you find them. It's in the Quran. Can you pick and choose? Do you go by the spirit of the book or the letter of the book? And if the book doesn't match the culture, do you say we now have to interpret the book or do you say, we just better take the culture back to the way the culture was at the time of the book. These are two different options. And uh, you know, one of them, I think, is more successful in the long run than the other. Uh, finally, Rumi, a Sufi poet, is Muslim too. And he says, out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about ideas, language, even the phrase each other doesn't make sense. And so I give the last word to Rumi, who is certainly as much a Muslim as anyone in ISIS. OK, do you guys have questions? <laughs> questions, comments, objections? Disagreement on the interpretation of Surah 9. Um, the, the thought of some is to say, well, you know, it says when the months are over, you can attack. Now, uh, what scholars who look at this 
say is, okay, when did the sura come into being? Um, and if it came into being in the midst of the war, the Medinan wars, then it could be simply saying, when these months are over, you can attack because we're in the middle of a war. That's a little different than saying, when these months are over, you can attack anybody you want. You see the difference? So um, it's, it's not clear, but most scholars today say that they think the context of this is we're in the middle of a state of warfare, that it doesn't say when these months are over, go attack anyone, anyone you like. Yes, I agree with that. Um, and that's part of the history that I didn't get a chance to touch on, but it goes hand in hand with the development of these um, different schools of Sharia. Yeah, it was during those first four Yeah, it's, uh, it's true that there is a lot of expansion. Um, and it is under the caliphs, though. It is not under Muhammad. They're, they're, right, but, but what I was saying is, if you say you're taking it back to Muhammad, here's what happened during Muhammad's life. Um, during Abu Bakr's life, and it's Abu Bakr and then it's Umar, where you see the greatest expansion. Um, now I can go back, I had a slide up there uh, quoting Abu Bakr, laying out you know, how to conduct yourself in warfare. So he's um, showing, giving a jus in bello argument. Um, he's not saying we can't uh, commit warfare. Umar was a soldier, and it's under Umar that you really get a push. But by this time, um, you're also moving away from Muhammad and from the original Medinan community. So when ISIS claims they're bringing back the original Medinan community, I'd say, well, not under Muhammad, they're not. You know, maybe under some of the other caliphs as things begin to change after Muhammad dies. Kelly. I'm struck as I'm listening to this conversation by the parallels to what has happened with Christianity. Yeah. Because yeah. Christianity was the first religion that was used to conquer the world. Yeah, yeah, um, with the same thing. Um, certainly, you know, Jesus basically says, turn the other cheek. Um, but once you get further on, and certainly once you get to Constantine, it's, um, hey, let's go out and convert everybody. Um, and actually the Muslims were less interested in conversion than the Christians were, partly because there are specific verses in the Quran that forbid, uh, or eh, basically speak at least against conversion. I put one of them up saying there is no compulsion in religion. There are other verses that say, um, you know, to you, your religion, to me, mine. That's, well, that's actually a saying of Muhammad's. Um, but in the Quran, God is said to say, I could have created all of you of the same religion if I had wanted to. I didn't because this gives you the opportunity to vie with one another in which group can do more good works. So, and so um, they weren't too big into conversion. Besides, when you did, they didn't convert people, they had to pay an extra tax. So <laughs> con converting people would hurt the pocketbook. Mike. That's hard to say, you know, just like it's hard to say what was the original attraction to Christianity. I think you touched on several of them. Uh, I think Muhammad must have been a very charismatic figure. Um, I think that um, it, there's the message of social justice certainly resonated with people of a certain class, you know, so particularly those who um, were not in power. Um, it, it was a message similar to the message of Christianity, I think, you know, of, of radical equality. So for slaves, for those who were in lesser tribes, for women, um, this message, I think, would have really resonated with them. 
Um, obviously, it didn't resonate with everybody because you've got the Meccans attacking Medina. So there was clearly a, a class um, and a group of people for whom this message was not um, the message they wanted to hear. Yeah. Um, could you speak a little bit about the, the cartoon in France? Is there something in the Koran that says we can't tolerate satire and, and the images of um, the prophet? Isn't that what sparked all the riots? Yeah. Um, basically, in Islam, Muhammad was very much against um, he himself being portrayed first because he feared that his followers were going to do with him what he thought Christians had mistakenly done with Jesus, which was elevate him to divine status after he died. Um, so he really did not want any depictions of himself um, because of that, um, that fear. That he continually said, I am just a man, you know, don't worship me. Um, plus, uh, in the Hadith, this is pulled out further to say it's actually not a good idea to make images of any living creature because remember the golden calf story in the Bible? Well, that didn't go so well, did it? Um, so there are prohibitions against images. Um, but primarily what people get upset about, they're going back to the prohibition against images of the prophet. Um, so that is prohibited, uh, but on different grounds, on the grounds that we don't elevate him to a god, not on the grounds that we denigrate. So it's, you know, it's a prohibition that is now being used and interpreted differently than it was its original intent. Maybe one more question. Uh, I, yeah, go ahead. Um, when you put up the question whether the uh, violence is coming from culture or from religion, you know, I think it's both. And I think those of us in organized religion should be able to admit that with all the beauty that's in it, any religion can be badly distorted. You know, my mm -hmm. religion, Catholicism, has hurt and oppressed people and done awful things. Mm -hmm. You know, so I don't want to say that I think Islam is worse in this town. I'm not trying to keep score or, or compare. But I do want to say as a religious believer that religion can be a force for ill. So I wish there were a way that we could say, yeah, it is a very awful and distorted version of Islam that is doing this because religion can do that. I agree with you, Anthony. That's absolutely true. And when I mean, religion is... Um, whatever uh, group that believe, that adheres to that religion says it is, really. You know, I mean, if ISIS were successful beyond their wildest dreams and wiped out the Shiites and the Sunnis and got everybody, every Muslim into their caliphate, then Islam would be what they say it is. Uh, it would not necessarily be the same thing that Muhammad thought, you know, that he was instituting. In other words, as soon as we make an institution of a religion, it becomes uh, a group of people and what they say it is. Um, it may not necessarily match what the founder said. So is, Islam, is ISIS Islamic in their claim that they're bringing things back to the way they were in the time of Muhammad? I would say no. Are they still a part of Islam? Uh, unfortunately, yes. How yeah. ISIS ISIS? Oh, that's a whole topic for a whole nother talk. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to get into the war in Iraq, what's going on in Syria, the whole history of colonization in the Middle East. Um, I, we just, uh, we don't have time for that, I'm sorry. But Noreen, where might they turn for more information? What, what sort of sources do you give even to your students as places to learn more? Well, right now my students are reading um, a book by Paul Daniker, which just came out about two weeks ago on the Arab Spring. And um, so I think it's called The New Middle East. Um, and uh, it's probably one of the most current um, and talks about. There are also some very weighty 
tomes. Um, there's one by Jessica, the name is escaping me at the moment, um, but on the rise of ISIS that goes into all the detail of the, the history. But it's, it's a very complicated thing. Um, we'd have to look at the history of the Middle East from about the time of World War I on to see um, where ISIS comes from. The, the, the elevator version, um, ISIS is a Sunni group which um, has, in a sense, subsumed elements of Al-Qaeda in that region. They have also been joined by a number of um, dispossessed Iraqi soldiers and military officers who remember when we invaded Iraq, we disbanded the military, which meant we had, there were a lot of people who suddenly, hey, what to do, right? What to do? Um, also, when we went into Iraq, Iraq the uh, Sunnis had long been the ruling group in Iraq. Um, we opened things up for the Shiites. The Shiites once had been persecuted by the Sunnis. Once they got into power, it was a little bit of tit for tat. The Sunnis are now looking for a way in that region to reconquer territory, to get their power back. Um, so that's, that's also going on. Um, they're also being heavily bankrolled by Saudi Arabia in what is essentially a proxy war between Saudi Arabia and Iran for which of those two countries will control the Middle East. Now, <laughs> try to sort all that out. <laughs> and you can come be a guest speaker in my class. <laughs> okay, thank you. I want to thank you all again for coming and remind you about the Lunch and Learn in November on the 16th with Father Eric Hollis. Have a great rest of your day.